so you know. Yeah, exactly. So, so Feast of Incarnation is, um, I think I've shared this numerous times over the years. It's just probably um, my favorite time of the year. Not because of the giving of gifts and getting of gifts and that kind of stuff, but it really is because of the what? Giving of the gift. Yeah, the gift. Not just a gift, the gift. And um, to me, I, the resurrection is, is exciting and special. Um, but I can see God kind of bringing things back to life. But the Feast of the Incarnation is mind-boggling to me. That he who was and is eternal, infinite, didn't just bring himself as a baby, which is what we celebrate now, the birth, but I think even nine months ago, if you would, we almost should have a celebration, the feast of the, of the um, conception. Yes. I mean, what a moment. Could you imagine? I mean, Mary doesn't feel it. She doesn't understand it. She just believes it's going to happen, right? But at that very moment, God isn't just confining himself to a baby. He's confining himself to a zygote. That's mind-boggling. And if you believe that life begins at conception, that's when God became man. Do you get it? And so what we celebrate now during this time is just really the, the, the fulfillment, the, 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 the moment that he enters, quote-unquote, if you would, into the world, you know? And, um, and so I love the Mary, didn't you, did you know, you know, and the one that you've delivered will soon deliver you. I mean, just an amazing time it is. So, so for me, I enjoy when we come into the season of just the remembrance of it. And um, the fact that God had, as we talked about this a little bit on um, Christmas Eve as well, and we're, we're going to talk about it more today, that God had this thing planned before he ever made the heavens and the earth. And that what happened on that night, that time in Bethlehem, was just, if you would, the fullness of time. And we'll see the verse in Galatians in just a little bit where God specifically states that, that it was in the fullness of time. There wasn't one more second that could be held in the, in the cup of time. And so today I want to spend um, some time going through some of the prophecies and stuff that we're looking toward. This is kind of a, a transitional time. Um, everything is being summed up in this one verse, Luke 2, verse 11, for there is born to you this day in the city of David, Savior who is Christ the Lord. And so this is kind of a transitional. I should have done this backwards. Anyways, next week we'll begin looking at the book of Daniel. What's exciting, though, when we look at the book of Daniel, and we're going to be looking at um, the impact of his God, the impact of his life, but the impact of his book. But there are then within his writings even then statements. And so, for example, talking about the rock, which, um, which was not made with hands, coming and destroying the 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 idol in the, that was there. Anyways, just a lot of fun. So I'm looking forward to going into the book of Daniel. But today we get this opportunity to spend a day considering the fullness of what God has done. And in that statement that the angels made to the shepherds. And so we're going to break it apart. If you have a sermon note sheet, you can see there's everything's there. There's no blanks, I don't think, on your page at all. Um, and so everything is there, and you have the verses. And we're just literally going to go verse by verse by verse, they're not going to be on the screen, okay? So if you got your Bibles, hopefully you got your Bibles, right? So we're going to be going through a lot of passages today. I cheated, and I have them all written out for me. Um, so um, that way, as time clicks down and I say, well, I'll just read this one for you. I already have it, okay? But let's turn to Genesis 3, okay? Because we want to start here. We're, we're told, for there is born to you, born unto you, right? And then we'll get to this day in a moment. For there is born to you. So what do we know? First of all, that the Savior was going to be born, right? Which means that he was going to have a human birth. We're told that all the way back in the beginning at creation. Genesis 3, this is part of the curses, right? So when Adam and Eve sinned and they, dis they disobeyed God, okay? Curses were brought upon them. And so... This is actually the curse, not to the man, not to the woman, but this is actually from the curse, which was given to the serpent. Yeah, okay? So Genesis 3, beginning of verse 14, we read, So Yahweh, 
God said to to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. So right off the bat, God is letting us know that he had a, a plan. He had a plan. This is, I mean, this is right after, right after the sin that, that brought the fall to mankind. But it didn't take God by surprise. He lets Satan know that actually what just occurred fell right into what he had already known. Satan wasn't able to disrupt God's plan. Rather unknowingly, he had stepped right into it. Does that make sense? How cool is that? Okay, turn to Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12. Anybody know without looking right away, what passage are we going to? Who is Genesis 12? One. The call of Abraham. Yeah, of Abram. Right, good. Okay. Um, But the call of Abram, right? And so right off the bat, we read, beginning verse 1, Now Yahweh said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house, to a land I will show you, and I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So what's exciting to me is we come from Genesis chapter 3, right? This curse that was given to um, Satan or to the serpent, right? Is that the Savior would be the seed of a woman, specifically, right? But that's pretty generic as well. He would be a what? A human. But now we're getting a little bit more specific here that he's going to be the seed of who? Of Ram, Abraham, okay? But, but if the last statement wasn't given in this, it would start to become more targeted. Think about it. What's the last statement? And in you, what? All the families of the earth shall be blessed. How many families? All. I think that's pretty cool. He doesn't say, and in you, all your descendants, your physical descendants, will be blessed. But he says, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Again, God had a a plan. And it wasn't just for Israel, physical Israel, but his plan was going to go beyond physical Israel to the entire earth. Okay? So next, we got Isaiah chapter 9, verse 1 and 2. We'll come back to Isaiah 9 later when we talk about um, him being the Lord. But in verse 1 and 2 of Isaiah chapter 9, we read, Nevertheless, the gloom will not be upon her who is distressed, as when At first, he lightly esteemed the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, and afterward more heavily oppressed her. By the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, in the Galilee of the Gentiles. The Galilee of who? The Gentiles. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has shined. In the Galilee of the the Gentiles, that God was declaring that even beforehand that there would be this disdain, if you would, of those from Judah, the Jews, toward those things which were from Galilee. What what were we told about Jesus being from Nazareth? Has any what? Has any good thing ever come out of Nazareth? Okay, and so, but those who were in the shadow of death, those who were in the darkness, the Galilee of the Gentiles, they would be able to see a great light. God was opening up the gospel, or would open up the gospel to the to the Gentiles. Not know about, about you, but that includes me, and I'm excited when I read these passages. Okay, Isaiah chapter seven. You can turn back a page or two in your Bible. Okay, where we read this is a prophecy that's given to Ahaz. Okay, and it's given to the the house of David, okay? Um, And so I'm going to begin reading at verse 12, because this is the context, okay? But Ahaz said, um, I will not ask, nor will I test Yahweh. Yahweh had said, look, I'm going to, I will, if you just trust me, 
I will deliver you. So go ahead and ask me for a sign. Whatever sign you want, no limit. Ask for a sign and I'll, and I'll, and I'll do it to prove, you, prove to you that I'm with you. This is Ahaz's response. I will not ask, nor will I test Yahweh. Then he said, hear now, O house of David, is it a small thing for you to weary men, but will you weary my God also? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. That God had planned for not just him to become from a seed of a woman, not just to all Gentiles, but that he specifically then, oh, I forgot to click this. He would specific, specifically then also be born of a, a virgin. He would do something that was unheard of. In my mind, I go back to Sarah having a baby. Why is Sarah having a baby such a big deal? She was so old, advanced in years. She was beyond childbearing years. And so God had already done that. For God to have another one, so for example, what happened just before Mary gives birth? Elizabeth. And what do we know about Elizabeth? She was beyond childbearing years as well, right? So God does another Sarah thing. Well, that's big. That's kind of cool. That's woohoo. But now God goes the opposite extreme, right? He does both extremes here. And now he has a woman who's never been with a man have a baby. The virgin shall conceive. And you shall call his name Emmanuel. And Emmanuel means God with us. What an incredible thing there is. And then finally, Genesis 49, 24. Um, again, this relates for, for me. I'm going to begin in verse 22 for context. And this is the blessings of Jacob upon his sons. And this is the, um, the blessing or part of the blessing to Joseph. Okay? And he says, Joseph is a fruitful bow, a fruitful bow by a well. His branches run over the wall. The archers have bitterly grieved him, shot at him, and hated him. Who are those archers? His brothers. Yeah. Isn't that kind of bad? Yeah. But his bow remained in strength in the arms of of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. From there is what? The shepherd, the stone of Israel. And so this is exciting to me because when the angels come and they declare this, who are they declaring this to? Shepherds. Shepherds. Yeah. And so he who was to be the, the shepherd of Israel had his heralds, Go and proclaim it to shepherds. He didn't go to the kings. He didn't go to the princes. He didn't go to the priests. He went to the shepherds. I think in my brain, another little slight indicator of who he was going to be. So there is born to you this day. So Luke, Luke uh, 2 is where this comes from, okay? But we don't need to necessarily turn there. But this is the whole passage. I'm not going to read it. This is the, the, the passage of Simeon and Anna. Does anybody know who Simeon and Anna are? Okay, somebody tell me. What do we know about Simeon and Anna? They're both advanced in years. Okay, true. Ah, they both were anticipating the coming of Messiah. They both, they have been told. Simeon clearly was told, right? And so they both knew that Messiah was coming, and they were waiting for him. And so when, when Joseph and Mary bring Jesus into the temple eight days after he's born, Simeon instantly recognizes him. And then Anna coming in joins in with the praise as well. My point here then is this day, you're not putting your hand up. I, I don't know if you're trying to get my attention or not. <laughs> you're good, you're good, you're good. So that this day was a day that was what? Planned. It was the fullness of time. And that's what we see in Galatians chapter 4. It says, when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, which we knew it was going to happen, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And so 
again, if I know you probably, probably, but maybe someone's here doesn't, but the word pleroma, okay, is the word for fullness, is again, that, that cup that you pour, you pour, you pour into it, but because of um, hydrogen bonding, you can actually put more than the cup full in that cup. But if you put one drop more, it spills over, right? So if you can picture that cup, just kind of bead it over, so you couldn't get one more drop in it, that's pleroma. So in the fullness of time that God was pouring the, the grains of sand, uh, the seconds of time into this thing. And when one more grain of sand couldn't go in, that's when Christ came. God, before the foundations of the world were laid, had a specific moment that Christ was going to be born. He wasn't gauging it based upon the world. You get it? We look at the world today and we think what? Well, it couldn't get any worse. Boy, he's got to be ready to come because look at what's happening. Do you know what? Jesus said that of that day and hour knows no man but my Father only. But there is a what? A day and a, an hour. Do you get it? There is a fullness of time that is still yet to be experienced when Christ is going to come again, just as he came here. Anna and Simeon were given knowledge of that, of how it was coming, and they were waiting for it. Genesis chapter 1, verse 14, that's the fourth day of creation. What's special about the fourth day of creation? What did God create on the, on the fourth day? The sun, the moon, and the stars. And so he put the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the, the night, right? But he stated that he made the sun, the moon, and the stars for some specific purposes. One of those purposes was that they would be for signs. The Magi were led by a star. People have debated that, and I'm not going to tell you exactly, Bob, this is it, this is what it is. What I'm going to say is that they followed a what? A star. They followed a sign. The sign was a star. Do you get it? God has this thing down. And people can talk about all they want about the, um, that, about the, 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 the grandfather clock that's there and you know God just kind of went to sleep. Well, he didn't go to sleep. I do believe there's kind of a, a kind of a clock mechanism going on between all the, the stars and the sun, the moon, and all that kind of stuff and planets, okay? I'm not gonna tell you what it is. I don't necessarily know it. But God told us that he put it there for a sign. Things are happening according to the plan of God. Does that make sense? And somehow the Magi knew that there would be a what? A sign. That there would be a star. And they were supposed to follow the star. And so we can debate all we want, what it was, and all that kind of stuff, but it doesn't matter to me. My, my takeaway from all that whole thing is that God had a what? A plan. And he's working the, he's working the plan. And he's revealing the plan to whomever he chooses to reveal it to, to fulfill that part of the plan. Genesis 49, verse 10. That also is from then Jacob's blessing of, of his children. This is the one of the blessing of Judah. And it says, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until what? Say it, Adler. Until Shiloh comes. I, my dog. No, anyway, no. <laughs> Jesus is coming again. Anyways, so, no. Until Shiloh comes. But who was Shiloh? Jesus. Jesus is ultimately the one who brings peace. Shiloh, I believe, is a derivative from the word shalom. And so he is the giver of peace. And so we know from Isaiah chapter 9, which we're going to go to in a little bit, that he's also called the prince of peace. Until Shiloh come, and to him shall be the obedience of the people. And so again, until Shiloh comes, tells us that God had a what? He had a plan. He had a purpose that he was enacting. Daniel 9, 24 to 26, okay? If you got your Bibles, turn there, okay? We're going to be turning there in a couple months from now, okay? But this is part of, to me, an exciting one from this whole perspective. Part of what is then applicable to us as well, okay? Even to today. Daniel 
beginning in verse 24, Daniel 9, says, 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city. Who are these weeks for? Say again. For the Israel, okay? For, for what? For your people and your holy city. So he's talking to Daniel. His people were the Jews. His holy city was Jerusalem, okay? And we'll talk about that more when we study Daniel, but that's an important point, okay? Seventy weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins. Wow, that's interesting. To make reconciliation for iniquity. Well, it sounds like something special is going to happen, huh? To bring in everlasting righteousness. How long? Everlasting. To seal up the vision in prophecy and to anoint. The word anoint is Mashiach. To anoint, which is where you get the word Messiah from, right? To anoint the most holy. To anoint the most holy. That's kind of fun. So there's going to be this, this, this period of 77s, right? And he goes on. Know, therefore, and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Mashiach, the Messiah, the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. The streets shall be built again in the wall, even in troublesome times. And after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. We'll talk about it more then. But each of these weeks is a period of seven years. We're talking about a period of 490 years. But 69 of the weeks are going to occur, 7 and 62, 69 of the weeks are going to occur between the time there is a decree to rebuild Jerusalem and the cutting off of Messiah. That sounds pretty specific to me. Does that sound specific to you? That means there were going to be 400 and what? 83 years between the decree of Artaxerxes to rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah would come and be cut off. How cold is that? And you'll wonder where Anna and Simeon might have got a, an idea from. Now, I don't know, they may have gotten a special word, okay? But those who studied the word, the scriptures, right? I mean, they knew what was going to happen. In fact, let me put these ones up here. Okay, these all go together about the, the coming forth of, of, of John the Baptist because they were also told that there was going to be someone who would come before, he would have a forerunner who would become before him. There were specific prophecies that were given when Messiah would be there. So if you studied the scriptures, like the priests did, right? So when Herod was worried because of what the wise men said, who did he call for? He called for the priests, right? He called for the scribes. And, and he says, where is he to be born who is to be born king of the Jews? And they said, oh, gee, Herod, I don't know. I mean, phew, there's a lot of scriptures. You know, we're not sure what it says. Give us, give us a couple of weeks to figure this one out. No, they didn't say that, did they? They knew, specifically, immediately they knew, and we'll talk about that one in a moment, where it's going to be Bethlehem, right? But they knew because they had poured over the scriptures, which means that they must have known what? These other ones. You tracking with me? But they chose not to what? Pay attention, believe, whatever. So, so we, then we have this forerunner. Then all of a sudden there's this guy hanging out in the wilderness in camel's hair, eating locusts and wild honey, looking a whole lot like Elijah. You know? That's, we're not looking at one yet but either, but the spirit of Elijah is going to come before Jesus comes, right? And so, again, all these prophecies that were given for, about him coming. And so we're told by these, again, by these angels, there is born unto you this day in the city of David. Why? Because Luke chapter 2, verse 4 tells us that Joseph was of the house and lineage of David. And so by coincidence, just by coincidence, what a marvelous coincidence could be that Quirinius, who was the governor of Syria, which was a, a region of Rome, right? That at that moment, he would be fulfilling the command of Caesar that all the world should be taxed and numbered. So Caesar wanted all this to happen. What a coincidence. And so Aquarius declared that everybody had to go back to the, the place of their lineage. So for Joseph, that meant he had to go back to the city of Bethlehem because that was the place of David. 
And so in Matthew chapter 2, verse 4, the 6, in Micah, verse 5 and 2, we read about that as well. We'll come back to Micah a little bit later, okay? But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you may be small among the thousands, you shall be great and mighty, right? And so it's quoted there in Matthew chapter 2. That's by the priests who knew exactly where Messiah was to be born, okay? Ruth 4, verses 11 and 17, what's special about Ruth? The book of Ruth. I mean, we're talking Christmas, and we're, we're in the book of Ruth. What's, what's Ruth for? Who's Ruth? She's a Moabitess. Say again. She's in the lineage of Jesus. She marries Boaz. This is kind of fun to me. Who was Boaz? He was the son of Salmon and Rahab. Rahab the harlot. Isn't that kind of fun, you know? You get, go all the way back to Jericho, and there's Rahab, you know? And she winds up marrying one of the two spies. How cool is that? You wonder why Boaz wasn't worried about having a Moabitess as his wife. He already had a Canaanite for his, either his mother or his grandmother. It depends on which, how you want to take that, okay? And so, so now you've got Ruth and Boaz. They, give, uh, they have a son whose name is Obed. I think about him every night. Oh, bed. Anyways. <laughs> but, uh, but then Obed, his son was Jesse. And the son of Jesse was David. Okay? And so this is all playing out with 1 Samuel 16, 17, and 20. That who David would be, right? And, and the movement to, to Bethlehem. So that Ruth and Boaz actually lived in Bethlehem. Okay, so though Jesse was from Bethlehem, actually that was the place of his lineage as well. But we go back to Jesse, and so we have Isaiah chapter 9, verse 7, and then chapter 11, verses 1 to 4, that also talk about how Jesse would be of that lineage. I want to look at Isaiah 11 real quick. Um, um, I don't have that one on my screen here, so let's, I know it, can you believe it? Because I wanted to make sure I turned to it. So I knew if I did that, I wouldn't make sure. So go, you go to Isaiah 11. Okay, and I got a Hebrew guy here, so that's giving you a warning, Gerard. No pressure, no pressure big guy. Okay, no, 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 I, he can just maybe semi-confirm, whatever, okay? But 11, verse 1 to 4, I'm going to read it, it says, There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The spirit of Yahweh shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and the spirit of understanding, the spirit of counsel, and the spirit of might, the spirit of knowledge, and the spirit of the fear of Yahweh. His delight is in the fear of Yahweh, and he shall not judge by the sight of his eyes, nor decide by the hearing of his ears, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor, and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall slay the wicked. So before we get to the part I was going to talk about, just going to verse 4, again, if you read Revelation, again, okay, that when Jesus comes back, right, on the white horse, the sword's going to come out of his mouth, and he's going to strike the nations with the sword of his mouth, okay? So the rod coming from his mouth, okay? But in the beginning there, verse 1, it says, And there shall come forth a what? A Nazar, okay? A Nazar shall come out of Jesse. And what's kind of fun about it is um, Joseph and Mary were from where? Where? Where were they from? Where were Joseph and Mary from? Nazareth. There would be a Nassar that comes from, am I right on that, Gerard? It's a Nassar? There would be a Nassar, a Nazareth, that comes. So Jesus would be called a what? Nazarene. Yeah. Not a Nazarite, a Nazarene. A Na John the Baptist was a Nazarite. That's where people get confused by all these pictures with Jesus with long hair and all that kind of stuff. He wasn't a Nazarite. He was a Nazarene. Now, I can't tell you that's exactly what's going on here, okay? But I just, studying it, I just think, wow, that's really kind of cool. Within the Hebrew, there's this kind of a little bit of a indicator that maybe, just maybe, God knew, <laughs> just maybe, where he was supposed to send the angel that night to see Mary and then Joseph, right? He'd send him to where? Nazareth. Yeah, so kind of fun. All right, so anyways, so we move on. So 
in the city of David, okay? And then we're going to see what? A Savior. A Savior. Now, the word Savior, um, so terion in the Greek, um, in, the, in the Hebrew as well, could be the concept of a deliverer, okay? And so for the, for the Jews, they always were looking for a deliverer, okay? We think Savior, okay, when we think of the term. But for the Jewish mind, they think a deliverer, okay? And that's why the, the struggle with, was that they were, a lot of people were looking for someone to deliver them from, say again? From Romans, not from sin. But we already read that from the, from the, the prophecies that, that from Daniel, that he was going to deliver them from sin, you know, and, and, and bring in an everlasting righteousness, okay? But again, they, they missed those concepts that were there, okay? They were written. So Matthew chapter 1, we're told then to, um, about Mary. She will bring forth a son. This is um, the angel speaking to Joseph, that Mary will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins, okay? Yahashua, Yahashua, Jesus, is Yeshua, which actually in this long form is Yahashua. Yahashua literally means Yahweh saves, Yahweh delivers. That Yahweh would be the deliverer. And so when this one who is to be born, who is to come, which we already know is Emmanuel, God with us, he would also be Yahweh saves. Does it make sense? Okay. Second Timothy chapter 1. I'll start verse 8. It says, Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony of the Lord, nor of me as prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God, who has saved us, delivered us, and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose, and grace which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. How cool is that? Okay. That his grace was bestowed to us before time began, but now has been revealed by the appearing of our Savior, our Deliverer, Jesus Christ, Jesus Messiah, who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And then Titus 2, verse 11 to 14, I love this passage. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope in the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, who? Jesus Christ. Who does Paul understand Jesus Christ to be? Our great God and Savior, our Deliverer who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. You can look at some of these other ones later on, but Jeremiah 23, verse 5 to 6, says, Behold, the days are coming, says Yahweh, that I will raise to David a branch of righteousness. A king shall reign and prosper and execute judgment and righteousness on the earth. In his days, Judah will be saved. Ezekiel 34 um, verses 23 and 24 says, I will establish one shepherd over them. It will be my servant David. In Ezekiel 37, verses 22 to 25, we read, And I will make them one nation in the land on the mountains of Israel, and one king shall be king over them all. They shall no longer be two nations. Remember, because Israel was divided, right? Nor shall they ever be divided into two kingdoms again. They shall not defile themselves anymore with their idols, nor with their detestable things, nor with any of their transgressions, but I will deliver them. Who will deliver them? Yahweh. I will deliver them from all their dwelling places in which they have sinned and will cleanse them. Then they, will, they shall be my people and I will be their God. David, my servant, shall be king over them and they shall all have one shepherd. They shall also walk in my judgments and observe my statutes. So Yahweh says, I'll be their God. They'll be my people. They'll only have one shepherd, one king, right? Zechariah 9, verse 9 then says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey. Does that sound like anybody? Pretty cool, huh? Okay. And then Isaiah 12, last one, verse 1 and 2, it says, And in that day, 
you will say, O oh, Yahweh, I will praise you. Though you were angry with me, your anger is turned away, and you comfort me. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid, for Yah, Yahweh, is my strength and song. He also has become my salvation, my deliverance. All these were indicators that the child who was to be born wasn't just to be a human. Though he was to be born of a woman, the seed of a woman, though he was going to be born of a virgin, well, that starts to get us a little bit more closer to the, it's not just a human, right? Okay. And though he was going to be born of the lineage of David, yet he was going to be more than just a seed of David. He was actually going to be Christ, Mashiach, Adonai, Christ the Lord. There was an understanding in the Hebrew mind, in the Jewish mind, from all these scriptures, and the ones we're going to be looking at in just a moment, who Mashiach would be. As we went through the book of John, do you remember how Jesus was emphatic who he was? And he says in John 8, 24, unless you believe I am, I am, you will die in your sins. Yes? And so you have to believe that Jesus is Yahweh. Or what's going to happen? You're going to die in your sins. And the Jews understood this. They got it. That he would be the son of God. Messiah, when Messiah came, he would be... Mashiach Adonai, he would be Yahweh in the flesh. How do we get that? All right, got your Bibles? We're looking at every one of these as we close, okay? Isaiah 7, again, verses 12 to 14. We're already there. We're going to look at it again. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, nor will I test Yahweh. Then he said, Here now, O house of David, is it a small thing for you to weary men? But will you worry my God also? Therefore the Lord, Adonai himself, will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and you shall call his name God with us. God with us. So turn the page to Isaiah 9. It's still all the same. Um, statements this is still being spoken to Ahaz, okay? Uh, chapter 8, we read about Assyria and how Assyria will overflow its banks and that kind of stuff. And so all of this is part of the same prophecy, okay? We go into chapter 9. And we looked at verse 1 and 2, which talks about how the people walking in darkness have seen a great light in the Galilee of the Gentiles, okay? So all of this is in the same context here. And we come down to verse 6. It says, For unto us a child is born, same child. We're talking about the same guy, same kid, who was called what? Emmanuel, right? For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. I know that there's a comma between the Wonderful and Counselor in a lot of your versions. There, it's not there for me. There are four doublets that are there. He's the Pele Yuitz. And when you look up Pele Yuitz, please do, check me out on this, okay? Only Yahweh is the one who is the giver of wonderful counsel. He is the Pele Yuitz. And I don't have time in this message to do that. I have another message in the past, and I can give you that, that proof, okay? But he is the only one who is the, the Pele Yuitz. Secondly, he's called the what? Mighty God. I mean, it, you know, he's the El Gabor. This is kind of a rough thing, you know, to, to say, well, okay, I could almost get, you know, he's a wonderful counselor. He's a guy, you know. I mean, there have been a lot of other people who have had given, what, really phenomenal counsel. Not according to Scripture, because the only one who's paid to was Yahweh. But still, if we look at the English, we can kind of say, but mighty God? This baby who was to be born would be called the El Gabor? the mighty God. And so what we read in Titus chapter 2, Paul clearly understands who Jesus was because he's the great God. And you look at the word great God there, you actually could put in mighty God. 
in Messiah. He's the mighty God in Messiah, Jesus Christ. So he's going to be called the mighty God. He's going to be called the what? Yeah, eternal or everlasting father. You could actually flip this. He could be the father of eternity. Does that make it easier on you? <laughs> this baby is going to be called the everlasting Aviad, the everlasting father, or the father Avi Odd, because Avi is father, Odd, eternity, the father of eternity. I don't know about you, but this boggles my brain how a child who's going to be born can be the creator of all eternity. <laughs> it doesn't compute. I mean, he's inside the box, but he's what? Outside the box. Way outside the box. He's going to be the Tsar Shalom, the Prince of Peace. The one who rules peace. And so the, the, um, the angels declared as well part of the, the, the praise at the end. And on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. But Jesus said, I didn't come to bring what? Peace. I came to bring a sword. Because if you think about what the angel said, that peace comes to who? Who does peace come to? Those who receive the goodwill of the God, of, of, of the Father. And so Romans chapter 5 says that we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. But Jesus came and brought a sword. He's a stumbling stone. If you believe in him and you come to the Father through him, you have what? Peace and goodwill. But if you reject him, what is there? There's enmity. That's still there. Micah 5.2. Turn to Micah 5.2. Where is Micah? Look it up. Micah 5.2. And this is mind-boggling to me, again, that the, the priests and the scribes can quote this and not get it. So Micah 5.2 says, But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, Though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one, the one, to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from old, from everlasting. The words there literally are from antiquity, so from way back, okay, so from, from old, but it still doesn't mean what? He's God. But I want you to think about that. There's going to be one who's born, whose goings forth have been what? From old. You have two options. This baby was preexistent in some manner, or you believe in reincarnation. You track it? I mean, I mean, because this child is from antiquity. But then it says, literally, the days of Olam, from the days of Olam, from the Yom of Olam. Olam, if you remember, is that which is just over the horizon. I like the word perpetuity better, perpetual is the, a better translation of it. Everlasting is good, okay? But in my mind, it's perpetuity. It just, it keeps going. When do you ever get to just past the horizon? You never do, because there's always what? The horizon keeps moving. And so this one, we're told, is from the past before the horizon of the past. Before the days of the horizon of the past, this guy existed. That's pretty mind-boggling to me. How could he be God? We know where he's from. He's from Nazareth. You know, we know his mother, we know his father, we know his brothers and his sisters. But this guy, when he's to be born, is to be born what? From forever. Isn't that kind of cool? And that's exactly who he is. Zechariah chapter 2. Zechariah 2. Verse 10.
Zechariah 2, beginning verse 10, says, Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion, for behold, I am coming and I will dwell in your midst, says who? Yahweh. I'm coming and I'm going to what? Dwell in your midst. Many nations shall be joined to Yahweh in that day and they shall become my people and I will dwell in your midst. Then you will know that Yahweh Sabaoth has sent me to you. Wait a second. Yahweh now is stating that he's being what? He's being sent. He's, twice he tells us, twice, I'm going to come and I'm going to dwell in your midst. And the nations are going to be joined to me. The Gentiles. And I'm going to dwell in your midst. And you will know, then you will know that Yahweh Sabaoth has sent me to you. Turn back now to Isaiah 48. Isaiah 48. Some of you, this is old hat. You've heard me share this before. But to me, this is exciting stuff. This is exactly the passages I go to when I'm challenged by a Jehovah Witness or a Mormon. You know, do I really believe what I believe? Beginning of verse 12. Listen to me, O Jacob, in Israel my called. I am he. I am the first. I also am the last. Who's talking? Who's talking? God. Yahweh. Okay. Indeed, my hand has laid the foundation of the earth, and my right hand has stretched out the heavens. When I call to them, they stand up together. All of you, assemble yourselves and hear. Who among them has declared these things? Yahweh loves him. He shall do his pleasure on Babylon, and his arm shall be against the Chaldeans. I, even I, have spoken. Yes, I have called him. I have brought him, and his way will prosper. Who's talking? Yahweh, this isn't Isaiah. Isaiah didn't call Babylon. Isaiah isn't over, over Babylon. There's a lot of people that say, this is Isaiah speaking. It's not Isaiah speaking. Isaiah hasn't been from the past. He didn't create the heavens and the earth. He didn't lay the foundations of the world. He's not over Nebuchadnezzar. Come near to me and hear this. I have not spoken in secret from the beginning. From the time that it was, I was there. And now, Yahweh Elohim, am I, am I doing that right? You're looking at Hebrew, Gerard? Is that, I think it's actually, it's got to be Yahweh, Yahweh Elohim. It is, it is Adonai Yahweh? Yeah. Okay, so now Adonai Yahweh in his Ruach have sent me. Yahweh is speaking. Yahweh is speaking. And he says, and now... Yahweh Adonai, or Adonai Yahweh, in his Ruach, his spirit, have sent me. It's the Trinity. It's the triunity of God, right in the Old Covenant. Yahweh, Jesus, the Son, would be sent by Adonai Yahweh, by the Lord Yahweh, and by his, what? His spirit. You got the Holy Spirit, the Ruach Chadesh, that's there. Again, I, I, if I was probably a Jew in that day, I'd probably missed it too. Okay? But hindsight is what? 2020. And God gives us the ability to read His Word and to see that He had a what? He had a plan. Do you get it? And what was happening at this time? 2,000 years ago-ish was the fulfillment of a plan. And God still has a what? A plan. Do you get it? He's still working out the plan. So my question is, do you believe that Jesus is coming again in the fullness of time? Just as he came. We're, we're, you're here. So you must believe he came. Do you get it? The question is, do you really, 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 do you really, really, really believe? that he's coming again? Or are we going to be shocked like the Jews were? We really weren't expecting it. Yeah, yeah, we read the scriptures. Yeah, yeah, we talk about the scriptures. Yeah, yeah, we study the scriptures. Yeah, yeah, we, we can quote the scriptures. But when it happened, we missed it. Casting Crowns has a song that one day we'll sing at Christmas. We did it years ago. Um, while you were sleeping. 
O Bethlehem, while you missed, while you were sleeping. But the, the final verse is America, what you missed while you're sleeping. Where we would rather worship trees and kill babies than worship him who loved us so much by coming to earth in the form of a baby. Do you really believe he's coming again? How has his first coming affected your life? I'm not asking how the second one is, because that's coming, right? Do you believe it? Well, we'd know that based upon how much the first coming actually affected your life. Has it really affected your life? God has given you every perfect gift. That's where we've been in, in the Advent reflections. God has given you every perfect gift. What have you given him then in return? And finally, is there a need then to change the way you think and therefore change the way you act? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you, Father, for giving us every good and perfect gift. And we know, as we shared Christmas Eve, that that perfect gift, the ultimate perfect gift, was you. You made us in your image and likeness, but then you came in our image and likeness, that you might conquer sin on our behalf, that you might conquer death on our behalf. And that wasn't just something that happened because you were reacting to everything else, but rather that you had a plan. And so in the fullness of time, you came, born of a woman, to be born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that you might present to us the gift of adoption. And I am so grateful to you for that, Lord. Help us to magnify you with our lives. Help us to be willing to offer our, our bodies as living sacrifices to you in response to what you have done for us. And to be assured, Lord, of, of the truth of your word and to be ready to give an answer, an account to everyone who asks us the reason for the hope that's within us. Lord, that we would be able to declare your truth to those who are in the world. In Christ's name, amen.